If you don't want to cycle on hills, all you have to do is go to Cape Cod. It's very flat there. And that's where we do most of our bike riding. I, I probably should disabuse you of the impulse to uh, congratulate me for driving all the way up here from the Philadelphia area this morning as though it was something heroic. Uh, I don't need to be congratulated for that for a few reasons. One is I'm a morning person. I love to get up early and uh, the drive on a morning like this is really pleasant. Another thing is when you pastor a church, you really don't get the opportunity to visit other churches very much at all. And I find that just a great privilege and a delight. Also, uh, I'm able to join with uh, good friends, Lee and Sharon Augsburger, who I've gotten to know because of our common connection at Westminster Seminary. And then the, the last thing is, my wife and, and daughter are throwing a birthday party for me uh, late this afternoon and the house is crazy with preparations, and it is a great place to escape from. Uh, I have just turned 70, and there's a lot of people coming, and I think the reason is they think they'd better come and say goodbye to me. <laughs> Though I'm telling them that 70 is the new 50. Amen. Amen. Well, I, I want to share with you from God's Word this morning, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 22. This is a passage that I've come to love, and I'd encourage you to pay close attention as I read God's Word for us. Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him, because he strongly opposed our message. At my first offense, no one came to my support. But everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. Eubulus greets you. And so do Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. This is the word of God. Let's pray. O Lord, may your Holy Spirit work through your word to accomplish what you've intended for it to do. And we especially pray that we would come to know and love and trust Jesus more. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Well, especially being connected to a theological seminary, I'd better avoid big words in my sermon, unless I explain them. But you can have some fun with them. So I have a, a word for you to introduce this passage, and it's pseudepigrapha. 
bet you haven't used that in the last week or so. It refers to writing that is fake, a fake document. Now, no less an authority than Wikipedia considers 2 Timothy as probably not authentic and references a well-known biblical scholar for that conclusion. His book is titled, 16 Forgeries in the Name of Paul. Well, why go into this? There can be a very practical reason for it. You may stumble on what are said to be the sure results of modern criticism that question the authenticity and reliability, the trustworthiness of Scripture, Usually, the best reasons for accepting the authenticity, the reliability, the authorities of, authority of our Bibles is right, what is right there in the text itself. There's certainly that element of truth in what I just read in 2 Timothy. And the material that I just read is very important for the question of who wrote the letter. Isn't there a lot of mundane stuff here? Various people are mentioned, some known, some unknown. There's updates on travel, even personal effects like scrolls and parchments and clothing, a cloak that the author needs. The commentator Gordon Fee considers all this and comes to this conclusion. A pseudepigrapher who created this especially in the light of the other concerns of these letters, would have been an extraordinary genius. Exactly right. Second Timothy has this inescapable personal feel to it, an inescapable ring of authenticity. You can't make this stuff up. It would take a much greater leap of faith to believe that Second Timothy is pseudepigraphical than to believe it really was written by Paul. You can trust that this little letter before us was written in the first century by the greatest theologian and evangelist of the church. It really was written by the Apostle Paul as he suffered in a Roman prison and was pretty sure he was about to be executed. Now, what do you do with the rich variety of subjects that come at the end of 2 Timothy? There are so many topics that cry out for preaching. Here are some possible sermon titles I could have brought to you. First of all, the shadow of apostasy. Demas appears in Philippians as a fellow laborer with Paul, which sounds great. He's mentioned in Colossians as just another associate. No statement about his worth. And here in 2 Timothy, as someone who abandoned Paul for the reason of his love for this present evil age, Demas failed to live by the power of the age to come that is broken in with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You could say Demas's pilgrimage could preach as a downward spiral of spiritual decline, ending, as far as we know, in apostasy. Here's another one. Celebrate second chances as a sermon title. The name Mark jumps off the page. The man who left Paul and Barnabas on the second missionary journey and then was the cause of a dispute between Paul and Barnabas because of Paul's firm opinion that he couldn't be trusted on the next missionary journey. Now he shows up as helpful to Paul in his ministry. Here's a story of a fall and a recovery. Anybody who loves old Phil Mickelson's victory in the PGA Championship in May would love the story of Mark's turnaround. And then another one, the gift of creature comforts. Here's a subject we could all love. The pleasure we can take in our stuff. This would be a healthy antidote to, another big word coming, asceticism. That's the spiritual disposition to deny yourself pleasure as though that is going to give you some sort of worth and brownie points before God. 
this sermon would come from the mention of the scrolls and the parchments and the cloak. Who knows what these scrolls were? It's possible that they were legal documents. Maybe Lee Augsburger would tend to think that's what they should be. But that doesn't preach very well, as far as I'm concerned. I prefer to think that the scrolls were Paul's copies of the Word of God, perhaps his own writings. Much better to think of the scrolls as something to bring him encouragement rather than to speed his legal defense. Paul knew the pleasures of the mind, and the written word was the best doorway to that life of the mind. The scrolls and parchments would help steady him in prison. And then the cloak. A commentator describes it this way. The cloak was a great circular rug-like garment. It had a hole for the head in the middle, and it covered a man like a little tent reaching down to the ground. It was a garment for the wintertime. And no doubt Paul was feeling his Roman prison cold. Even as we're in August... We can use our imagination to appreciate how much a warm blanket would feel like life itself by wrapping wrapping it around your shivering frame. And then one last idea of a sermon topic that could emerge from this, toxic people. These days, people like to point out that some people are not safe, and Paul would seem to endorse that idea. Someone named Alexander, who was a metal worker, was an opponent who did Paul great harm. There's no need to speculate on what the harm was, but it teaches us not to be naive. Some people are not going to be won over by Christian grace. They will stab us in the back. Paul wants Timothy to be on guard and not walk into a trap set by Alexander the metal worker. Well, so much for all these varied themes. Is there a way to see all of this material as centering on one thing? Well, I think the random thoughts and people mentioned by Paul show how closely he shared life with Timothy. And I would suggest that what can bind this passage together are those words, do your best to come to me quickly, in verse 9, and then come before winter, in verse 21. Paul was with Timothy in the same way he was with the Corinthians. He wrote to them, our heart is wide open, 2 Corinthians 6, 11. Timothy responded by opening his heart to Paul. Paul poured his life into Timothy, but he also received from Timothy, who poured his life into Paul. And this is a picture, then, of gospel friendship, of the special bond shared by those who are partner in the ministry of the gospel. It's confirmation that it is not good for a person to be alone. Of course, marriage is an answer to that need, but friendship is also. Not everybody is called to be married, but I would say we are all called to Christian friendship. We are meant for community, for fellowship. The preacher in Ecclesiastes writes this in chapter 4, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But anyone who falls and has no one to help them up, pity that person. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. So, considering all this, here's the main point I want to bring to you from this passage. As you pour your life into gospel friends, Jesus will be near you when you stand in greatest need. 
I'm convinced we all need this message. We're hopefully coming out of a time of unprecedented isolation and seclusion. It's been tough on churches. I'll never forget a pre-COVID sermon that I heard on Paul's frequent expression at the end of his letters, greet one another with a holy kiss. The preacher made the point that human contact is vital, is at the center of Christian fellowship, and that some people are so isolated that if they don't get a hug at church, they won't get one anywhere. Human contact is so important. Friends are essential. We hope we're coming out of the COVID era. We should renew our sense of how wonderful it is that faith in Jesus opens up so many new friendships and reasons for getting close to people we would otherwise never know. Now, I want to open this passage to you in two major steps. First of all, the presence of friends, and then second, the presence of the Lord. So, first of all, the presence of friends. Consider this man, Paul. He was an intellectual and a theological giant. And we'd be tempted to think that any relationship that Paul had, such as the relationship with Timothy, would be one-sided, that Timothy would be the one receiving and Paul would be the one giving. But Paul received from people. When he began the monumental letter to the Romans, he wrote to them that he wanted to visit them, quote, I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong, Romans 1.11. That's what we would expect. Paul would visit the Roman Christians and give to them. But he then quickly makes it clear that the relationship would not be one way. In verse 12, he says, that is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Or think of what he wrote in the second letter to the Corinthians when he told them the story of his visit to Troas. He writes in 2 Corinthians 2, 12, now, when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. Think of this. Here's the mighty apostle landing in Troas, seeing a door open for him, it's not even necessary to say that door would be opened by the providence of God. But he didn't feel right because Titus was not there as he expected him to be. And we'd expect Paul would then give us a testimony about putting such concerns aside and walking through that open door because it's much more important. But what he says is, I said goodbye to them. He did not go through that open door. Have you ever heard a testimony from a ministry partner who would say that faced with a choice of an open door for the gospel and the need to be close to another Christian because his soul was so bereft and need of encouragement that he didn't go through the open door, but he had to connect with that person? That's not the kind of thing we're used to admitting or even setting as a priority, the being with our Christian brothers and sisters. Now, Paul's relationship with Timothy was clearly not one-sided. He began the letter this way, I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I've had to ask myself in thinking about this passage, do I have people in my life 
brothers and sisters in the Lord that I've gotten to know where the feelings about them were enough to bring tears to my eyes, rolling down my cheeks, dropping down onto the page. Another question, try this for yourself. Do you have friendships in Christ that fill you with joy? And have you ever told a Christian friend, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy? And these are good questions to ask, and these are good openings to our hearts as to how God wants us to be with other believers. Now, the apostle has reached eloquent heights in this letter. Just before our passage, he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And in the passage that I read, he seems to be descending from those heights. It's now time to talk about what he needs. He needs Timothy to bring some of his stuff that will help him in prison. But he needs Timothy more than ever. Do your best to come to me soon. Do your best to come before winter. Partly, apparently, that's tactical travel. The Mediterranean was closed to shipping from November to March, one commentator wrote. But it's also the life of the soul that Paul knows and understands and shares with Timothy. There's such a thing as the dark night of the soul, and Paul seems to be experiencing it, a kind of winter of the soul. And he's thinking, it's bad enough in prison now. It will all be worse when winter sets in, if I'm still alive. There's a Shakespeare sonnet, number 97, that has a few lines that go like this. How like a winter hath my absence been from thee, the pleasure of the fleeting year. What freezings have I felt? What dark days seen? Paul had established a friendship with Timothy that brought the redeeming grace of God more firmly in his grasp. He learned what Proverbs 27.9 means, the pleasantness of a friend springs from their heartfelt advice. So that's the presence of friends. Now move on to the presence of Jesus. First of all, we note that Paul is isolated. There are times when you don't have people around you, no matter how much you need them. And Paul had an experience of isolation is in his imprisonment in Rome, an experience worse than loneliness. It would be better to say it was abandonment. And he writes to Timothy about the experience. Now, there must have been some preliminary hearing or trial for Paul. It was something we infer from what he says here, at my first defense. There must have been an opportunity for any friend of the apostle to be with him in that situation. You picture him standing before the authorities, and they would have given him the opportunity to have someone on his side stand with him. There's something no doubt significant about the word stand. When you're brought to trial before authorities, you have to stand up. You are in plain view. You are exposed. You stand in respect of those in authority over you in the courtroom. Well, people who had been with Paul in less demanding situations did not show up then when he needed them. All deserted me, he writes. In a situation of crisis where he was left standing all alone, the Lord stood by him and strengthened him. Now, ask yourself the question, what was threatening Paul at his first defense? It surely wasn't the legal threat that he was afraid he'd be condemned to death by the Roman authorities. Paul seems to have concluded that is going to happen 
to him. He had no hope of being released. There was another mortal threat that was hovering over the apostle at his first defense, and he compares that to the lion's mouth. Now, a lion's mouth could certainly represent the fangs of the state that can bite you and kill you as they bring you to trial and find you guilty and liable to punishment. But surely that image of the lion is a picture of the demonic power that often lurks behind the power of the state, growling, threatening, menacing jaws with sharp teeth and inhuman power are images of the devil's legion. Paul felt their power. We can be sure of what the temptation was by what Paul says was the result of God's deliverance, that the message might be fully proclaimed. So the temptation must have been a failure of nerve, the temptation to collapse inside at the power of the authority arrayed against him, a failure of nerve that could cause him not to be bold, as he so often asks his friends to pray for him. So the demonic threat would be to shrink back, to lose nerve, to be silent, and not to preach Christ. I can imagine the devil saying to Paul, look at you, a common criminal, a nobody, worse than a nobody. Nobody bothered to stand with you. How can somebody like you have anything to say to these noble men of Rome, these men who have real power and authority, unlike you who stand before them at their mercy? Give me a second to take care of this. Okay. There we go. I think we're in business again. <clears throat> the temptation was to shrink back. But Paul was delivered. The Lord's presence helped Paul escape that demonic power that would silence him. Instead, the message was fully proclaimed. Paul preached at his defense, and he preached fully. He doesn't tell Timothy what he said, but his friend Luke tells us in the book of Acts that when Paul, on a few other occasions, was brought before rulers, this is the kind of thing he said. When he spoke to King Agrippa... The king was amazed at Paul's boldness in using the opportunity to preach to him. And he said in Acts 26, 28, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul answered, Short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains." Does that sound bold? Or consider Paul's defense before a governor named Felix. Luke writes in Acts 24, as Paul talked about, self, about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. Felix was afraid. He couldn't take the pressure as a ruling authority passing judgment on a prisoner of what the prisoner was telling him about faith in Jesus Christ. Felix, not Paul, lost his composure. So we can assume that Paul took the opportunity at his first defense to preach about Jesus and the resurrection. His calling as an apostle to the Gentiles was fully accomplished. The promises about the preaching of the risen Messiah in the last days to all the nations was fulfilled by the apostles' preaching. He was able to 
join with the powers of the age to come as strengthened by the Holy Spirit, he proclaimed Jesus. And Jesus was with him, standing with him in his crisis. Now, there's one other way that Jesus was with Paul when he was abandoned. He was with him in his word. The reference to the lion's mouth in verse 17 is the pointer to a passage of scripture that Paul had in mind, no doubt, and used to tell Timothy about his defense. The main element of Paul's experience are these. Number one, he was deserted by friends. Number two, he felt the demonic threat. Number three, there was proclamation to the Gentiles. And number four, there was evidence of the reign of the suffering and risen king. Paul saw Psalm 22 fulfilled by Jesus. And I want to just ask you to look at a couple of verses in Psalm 22 that show these same four themes played out in this psalm. In verse 11, this heartfelt cry, do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help, just like Paul, deserted by friends. Verse 21, rescue me from the mouth of the lions. And that's the verse that is the climax of the frightening image of wild beasts surrounding the abandoned son of David. It reflects Paul sensing the attack of the demons. Verse 22, I will declare your name to my brothers in the congregation. I will praise you. Paul proclaimed God's name to the Gentiles at his trial. And then verses 27 and 28, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. That's the reign of the suffering and risen king. Whether Paul was meditating on Psalm 22 as he stood on trial, or if perhaps after the trial he realized that Psalm 22 explained how Jesus delivered him because Jesus experienced everything that he did and was victorious through it, Paul understood that the risen Jesus Christ was with him. When he was abandoned by people, he was not abandoned by Christ. Paul was filling up and completing some of the suffering of the body of Christ that was still outstanding. Probably some of you have <clears throat> watched some of the video series named The Chosen. I've watched all 16 episodes, two seasons on the gospel accounts of Jesus. And what has impressed me is that the imagination that the filmmakers have used in depicting the gospel stories always seems in total uh, commitment to the text of Scripture never going beyond it, always trying to expound it. If I was filming something about the drama of Timothy receiving this letter, I, th I think I would imagine Timothy pouring over this over and over again after Paul was gone, beheaded by the Roman authorities, and that it would dawn upon Timothy that Paul's experience brought him to Psalm 22 and how Jesus experienced abandonment, demonic power, but the proclamation of the truth to all nations and resulted in the reigning of the risen king. And it would seize Timothy's heart that the apostle had shared what was most precious about what saw him through. 
Well, God puts us in the body of Christ. We are members together of his body. When one member suffers, the whole body suffers with that one member. We are meant to grow together, not as isolated individuals. As we pour our lives into other people in the life of the church, we get closer to Jesus through his people. They are, we are his body. Those friendships in Christ should be deep and precious. Probably nobody on his deathbed ever wished he had spent more time at the office or with his investments or with his hobbies, but just about everyone realizes he should have put more time into the people that he loved the most. These gospel partnerships are vital, but they are also fragile. We are all vulnerable to finally being left alone. And as we face death, we will leave our friends behind. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. That friend is Jesus. As you pour yourself into gospel friendships, as Paul did to Timothy, you will come to know Jesus better. And you will find that when all the other friends are gone, Jesus will be near you when you stand in your greatest need. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, I pray that you would help us to understand the gracious heart of the Lord Jesus who calls us to come to him, to believe in him, and to know life eternal. We pray this in his name. Amen.